Hello, welcome back to 3 News Now. I'm Stephanie Haney. Today is Wednesday, March 24th. Thank you for being here for the top stories from WKYC.com and our WKYC app. We start today with another update out of Boulder, Colorado. We are now learning that one woman among the 10 people who was killed is an Ohio native. That woman is Lynn Murray, age 62. She was one of the 10 people shot and killed while shopping in the grocery store in Boulder, Colorado. She was raised in Mentor and went to Ohio University. She was a retired photo editor whose resume included publications like Glamour, Marie Claire, and Cosmopolitan. And in an interview with The Post, her daughter, Olivia McKenzie, called her the biggest light in everybody's life. She said that her mom was the least deserving person to die this way. Lynn Murray is survived by her husband and two children. The other nine victims of that shooting in Boulder, Colorado, range in age from 20 to 65, and one of them was Boulder Police Officer Eric Talley, who was the first to arrive on the scene. A suspect has been arrested and charged with 10 counts of first-degree murder. Now, with this happening in Boulder, Colorado on Monday, a lot of people are bringing up the issue of gun control again. So we have a breakdown for you on WKYC.com to let you know where states stand in terms of tightening or loosening gun control laws. Here's one thing that our reporters have noticed. The stand your ground laws, as they've been called, are gaining traction. And here in Ohio in January, Ohio Governor Mike DeWine, a Republican, signed one of these so-called stand your ground bills into law. And what that does here in Ohio is that takes away a person's duty to retreat before using that kind of force. Now, Governor DeWine did this despite the fact that he continues to criticize Republican lawmakers in Ohio for ignoring legislation that he has sponsored that wants to toughen background checks and boost penalties for felon, felons excuse me, that commit new crimes with guns. The governor proposed those measures following the 2019 mass shooting that happened right here in Dayton, Ohio. Now, a similar stand-your-ground measure has been approved by the South Dakota legislature and is awaiting signature from Republican Governor Kristi Noem in South Dakota. For a breakdown of all the states, you can check that out on WKYC.com. Related to the Bowling Green State University sophomore's death, Stone Fultz, and a family attorney has now revealed that his blood alcohol content was at .394 in medical reports and that it was likely even higher right after what's been called hazing that happened that led to his death. Now, that's almost five times the legal limit here in Ohio, which is .08. And according to a calculator from the nonprofit group Aware Awake Alive, for a man weighing about 165 pounds, which is indicative of what Fultz weighed, a BAC of about .4, that would require 20 shots of 80-proof alcohol in two hours. Now, Fultz was 20 years old. He was a sophomore at Bowling Green State University from the Dublin area. He died on March 7th. These, this is several days after an alleged hazing incident that involved alcohol at the Pi Kappa Alpha off-campus event. That fraternity is often referred to as the Pike Fraternity. That happened on March 4th, and the fraternity has been placed on interim suspension while this is being investigated. In the meantime... Our senator for Ohio, Sherrod Brown, is pushing for anti-hazing legislation. He held a press conference today, and he said there have been more than 50 hazing-related deaths since 2000 on campuses across the U.S. So he's talking about the REACH Act today, and that's legislation that was previously introduced that would crack down on hazing on college campuses. It would require schools to report hazing on annual crime reports and also establish a clear definition of what exactly hazing is and require these institutions to educate students on hazing and the dangers. Here in Ohio, there was a bill presented on March 11th, Senate Bill 126, that would also focus on hazing, and it would require providing resources and education to make sure that it doesn't happen and make hazing a felony in Ohio. And right now, it is a misdemeanor in Ohio, the difference there being the amount of time that you can spend in jail or prison. Misdemeanor is typically a year or less. A felony would allow for more than a year in prison time if you are convicted of hazing. Another update for you. Here in Ohio, we have now officially pushed back the tax filing deadline to March 17th. That's in line with the federal IRS deadline that's been pushed back to March 17th. So that's about another month to get your taxes filed, and you won't incur any penalties for any taxes owed in that extra month right there. Now, Ohio health officials are warning 
sending out a warning because Republican members of our legislature are preparing to override a veto. This is about a Senate bill that would allow state lawmakers to rescind public health orders issued by the governor and the Ohio Department of Health as soon as they take effect and also stop the governor from reintroducing a similar order if that happens for at least 60 days. It would also limit state of emergency orders to a period of 90 days and allow lawmakers to extend them in 60-day increments beyond that point. Now, Governor DeWine has warned that this bill would really tamper the state's ability to address emerging public health crises and open up local health departments to lawsuits by anyone who disagrees with their enforcement actions. Now, Governor DeWine said he will veto this, but Ohio Republicans say they'll override that veto. If that happens, this will be the first override for the Republican governor since he took office in 2019, and Ohio local health departments are not in favor of this being brought into fruition, being made into law with overriding of a veto. They laid out their concerns in letters to Governor DeWine on Tuesday. You might wonder why they're not sending those directly to the members of the legislature here in Ohio, because those are the people who will potentially be overriding this veto. But in these letters, they documented that the bill would slow down or block local officials from ordering businesses to close or requiring residents to quarantine or isolate without a medical diagnosis. In Franklin County, health officials specifically wrote that orders like these are utilized sparingly, talking about those emergency orders that they want to limit, that the legislature wants to limit, and almost always invoke guidance and expertise from the CDC or the Ohio Department of Health. So obviously this is something that we'll be following very closely. Now let's take a look at the latest COVID-19 numbers across the globe here in the U.S. and in Ohio. The global and U.S. numbers come from Johns Hopkins University. Globally, the total number of reported cases is now at 124,477,094. The total number of deaths is now at 2,738,603. We're staying steady at the percentages we saw yesterday. The U.S. has 4% of the global population, but the most cases and the most deaths with 24.1% of the COVID cases and 19.9% of the COVID deaths. In the U.S., the total number of cases is nearing 30 million. It's at 29,938,837. The total number of deaths is now at 544,452. In the latest numbers from the Ohio Department of Health, we've seen more cases in the last 24 hours, over 1,800 more cases. That's up from yesterday. And the total number of deaths, we do not have any updated information on that. Again, remember, that's not being reported daily anymore because it's now being based on death certificates. And those only come in every few days to the Ohio Department of Health. There are now uh, 123 new hospitalizations related to COVID in the last 24 hours. That's down a bit from yesterday. But there are 917 people being treated in the hospital right now, and that is up. And out of those people, 239 are being treated in the ICU. That is also up. And we've seen 13 new ICU admissions in the last day. That's up by one from yesterday. Taking a look at the people who have been vaccinated for COVID-19, over 14% of Ohioans have been fully vaccinated now. That's almost 1.7 million people, and about 32,000 more people in the last day have gotten that final vaccination, whether that's that first Johnson & Johnson shot or that second Pfizer or that second Moderna shot. The people who have started the vaccination were at over 25% of Ohio's population. That's close to 3 million people, and in the last day, about 65,000, more than 65,000 people have started that process. Bad news, though, in Summit County. Bummer news in Summit County for people who were waiting for that mass vaccination site at Summit County Fairgrounds. The opening of that is delayed. That was originally scheduled to open up on Monday, this coming Monday, March 29th. But the Akron Beacon Journal reports that it's delayed because of a delay in shipments of the COVID vaccine. So now it's estimated that the site will open in early April. Now, this coming Monday marks the official day where all Ohioans 16 and older are officially eligible to receive the COVID vaccine. But again, earlier this week, Governor DeWine did say that if there are open appointments, he is authorizing places to open those appointments up to all Ohioans 16 and older now so that those appointments can be put to use. Now, here's a troubling story for a mother out of Tennessee who traveled to Mexico, took all the proper precautions and traveled to Mexico and had an issue with her breast milk returning from Mexico. Now, she didn't have a problem getting there because she didn't travel with breast milk, but Sarah Morrow was in Cabo, and while she was there, she pumped 145 ounces of breast milk. That's 
a little more than a gallon of milk. And she had previously researched the protocols for traveling with breast milk and did everything according to TSA guidelines, but those guidelines are different than the guidelines in Mexico, and she was returning from Mexico. So despite the fact that while she was on her trip, she pumped breast milk for more than 10 hours, she packaged it all up, she had it all frozen. When she got there, she was told she couldn't bring it on the plane with her. She was traveling on American Airlines out of Mexico. She was told if she had a child with her, she would be able to bring it, but only in a three ounce bag, which of course is much less than what she had, which was 145 ounces. So she was forced to check the cooler with American Airlines. Well, that presented a problem because when she got to her connecting flight in Dallas, it was delayed and she had to stay in Dallas overnight. So at that point, she was trying to figure out how she could get the milk, which was on ice, checked in the American Airlines plane. And what they told her was that it had already gone on to her final destination. So she paid someone $100 to go and pick that up at around midnight, but it wasn't there. It was still in Dallas. And she said that what she's upset about is the lack of the sense of urgency, the lack of accountability in figuring out where exactly her breast milk was and how they didn't help her to make sure it avoided spoiling because when she finally got the, ba the box of breast milk back the next day in Knoxville, Tennessee, it had completely melted and was completely ruined. She said this, she said, it's an extension of you and an extension of your child. It's what your child needs to survive. So she was very upset about this and what she wants to see happen is she wants to see airlines allowing breast milk in carry-ons regardless of whether the child is there to prevent something like this from happening to mothers. She said that American Airlines did contact her. They offered her a $200 voucher and she turned it down so she will be continuing to advocate for this but very upsetting situation that happened to Sarah when she got back to Knoxville and found out that all of that breast milk had been spoiled. Now let's turn to sports. The 2021 NFL mock draft is something a lot of people are thinking about. The draft coming here to Cleveland at the end of April, beginning of May. And just with a little bit of more than one week into free agency, what teams have needed across the NFL has changed a little bit. Here's something we're not used to seeing. The Cleveland Browns aren't picking in the first round of this NFL draft until number 26. So our three new sports analyst has created a mock NFL draft of what could potentially happen when that kicks off here in Cleveland at the end of April. And it's possible that at the number 26 pick, the Cleveland Browns could go for Asante Samuel Jr. He's a cornerback out of Florida State. Now in free agency, the Browns have focused on the defense and it's a possibility that that trend could continue in the draft. So Samuel Jr. is the son of a four-time Pro Bowl selection and he has both the athleticism and the versatility that is typically something that Cleveland's front office has been valuing. So that's a possibility. If you want to see a rundown of that mock NFL draft, go ahead and go to WKYC.com and our WKYC app to see that from Ben Axelrod. Question for you before we let you go today. The Big Ten announced today that it will allow fans at spring sporting events. That includes football spring games. Would you feel comfortable attending a football game at this point? We would love to hear your thoughts on that. We have a post up on the Facebook page. It went up at 12 p.m. today, so if you want to check that out and comment, weigh in. I'll be talking about your comments today in the Trending Stories segment in Clicking in Cleveland on What's New at 5 p.m. That's where I'll see you next, so drop by. You can watch that for free on the WKYC app. You can also watch it on your Fire Stick or your Roku. If you have those apps, make sure you download the WKYC app on both of those platforms. You can catch our shows there as well. That's it for today. I will see you back tomorrow with more 3 News Now. Between now and then, everyone, stay safe and be well. I'm Stephanie Haney.